Let's do this. Okay. Hi, I'm Mimari. I'm a meditation coach. I am a mother of four and I've had one abortion in my life. All right. So I was 20 years old. So this was back in 1997, back in 1997. And I had just got into college, just starting my my first semester and uh, I found out I was pregnant and it was a chaotic time in my life it was I wasn't I wasn't aware of who I was what I wanted to do who I wanted to be to even think about being a mother um that was just a strange time in my life I I don't even know who or what I was heading into being, I literally had just like, all right, I'm here. And now I find out I'm pregnant. So it kind of sucked. <laughs> it was with a partner. Um, we just were living in different states because of me going to school. And I, I didn't know how to let him know. I knew he would never be towards me getting an abortion he would never be supportive I guess you can say and and so for me it was like a difficult moment to to even reach out to him and tell him however I did and um it was a huge fight and and I ended up tossing a phone across the room and <laughs> not wanting to speak to him again but I ended up seeing him again obviously and and I'm trying to like, just go back to that, that moment in my life and just see myself and how, and how I felt like super free to have that choice. I felt so free that I can actually say, well, I'm not going to have a baby right now. And I don't need to have a baby right now. And adoption for me was never an option. So it was like very empowering in that sense that I knew that I had a fucking choice and I can choose for myself, no matter what the fuck anybody else wanted to say about it. And it just like, it kind of like rolled over. Like I found, I find out I'm pregnant. I break down and cry because that was not in the plans. I had a very supportive friend that I had literally just met like weeks prior who sat with me and talked me through the process because she had been through one. And so that was really helpful. And so after speaking to her, she was actually with me. I literally found out at a pizza place um, and she was there with me. So we sat outside, we talked and she essentially was like, you know, it's the choice you have to make for yourself. And I didn't take much time to think about it. I knew exactly right away what I was going to do. It wasn't, it wasn't um, a hard choice to make for me. And, and I did. However, in making that choice, I was also very well aware of the idea that how am I going to fund this? <laughs> because at that time, we didn't have like a pill that you can take. So it wasn't as accessible it was like you have to go to the clinic you have to make an appointment you have to pay it all by the day or else they won't do it um so that was difficult for me and it was you know it was a difficult amount for me in that moment I think it was like six hundred dollars I was just starting college I had no funds <laughs> and so after speaking to the father he mentioned that he would come, be supportive, and actually pay for it, which was great. However, because of how he reacted initially, one of the girls I had met in moving into my, my school dorm or whatever, um, she said, I'm going to have it for you in case he doesn't come through. And he came and he didn't have the funds and she was the one that rescued me she was my angel in that moment and she supplied the funds for it so that's how that went in the very you know 
beginning stages of getting to my abortion and having that process started. After we were inside the day of, the morning of, um, the rating room was packed. Like there are so many people there. Like I was like, oh shit, like this many fucking women are coming in to have this done. Like, oh. So initially in the waiting room, it was my friend, him, and I. I went up and I paid the rest of the balance that was due. And um, they had me sit down and wait a little bit longer. Then they called me up. No one was allowed to go past that waiting room, essentially. And they brought me into a new waiting room. Um, there were a lot of security guards, which was you know, very strange for me. Um, they were armed and everything. And in the second waiting room, I was alone. There were other people there that were waiting to get their abortion. And um, they pumped me up with, all kinds of meds. Um, some were antibiotics, some were some other shit. I really don't know. I don't remember what it was. And then they had me wait. And from 10 o'clock in the morning to about three o'clock in the afternoon, I literally sat in that waiting room, waiting, waiting for a five minute procedure. It was kind of hellish because I was going through um, nausea, a bit of torture, right? Prior to the procedure. <laughs> I felt like it was the end of the world. I was like, I can't believe I'm so sick. I'm so hungry. And I feel like I'm going to vomit. And I'm sure those are all pregnancy symptoms anyway. But <laughs> they were just like intensified in that moment. And that, that, you know, hours of waiting, it was intensified. No one to talk to, for one. And you're alone. And you're, it almost makes you feel like you just want to run out of there and just get the fuck out. That's how I felt. Like it didn't feel like a safe space. The like, it wasn't just the wait time. It was the behavior of the staff. They were very distant and detached. Like there was nothing. When you go to a hospital for procedure, people are a little bit kinder to their patients. It's not that they were mean, it's just that they were very cold. It's just a very cold environment with attitudes and it's like, let's get this done. Like, this is your next step. This is your next step. Like no one even talks you through the step. At least not up until I got in the room and I actually had a nurse with me and she really talked me through the whole process. And she was there and she held my hand. And that was like the first moment I felt like I wasn't alone. Like she made a hell of a lot, like a big difference in the whole experience. It just went from that robotic like movement to like, oh, here's some compassion. Here's someone who understands. Get in the room. They, you know, they have you undressed from the waist down. They explained everything that was going to happen. Um, no anesthesia or anything like that. Um, I just kind of said, this is going to feel uncomfortable. You're going to feel some slight discomfort. Um, it was the nurse who kind of was like distracting me from everything else while the doctor was doing what she needed to do. Um, so the nurse was asking me questions about myself. She asked me like what I was doing um, in my life, like, and I told her what I was going to school for. And she just kept my mind off of what was happening. Although I was feeling everything. <laughs> I felt when the doctor inserted the, the suction contraption. I don't know what the fuck it's called. But I felt when that was inserted. I felt when... God, this sounds horrible, but when she turned on that the vacuum that takes out everything, um, it felt very crampy. Um, not contraction, crampy, but like, I don't know, it just felt very crampy. Like almost when you have a best, like upset stomach and you might be getting the runs. <laughs> That's the only thing I can compare it to. That's what it felt like. And I and I remember just like making faces and then I was just was like, just hold my hand, squeeze my hand if you need to. 
And I told her, I was like, it feels weird. And she was like, yeah, it's uncomfortable. So you're gonna, you're doing fine. Just breathe through it. And she just kind of like kept me calm. So I didn't panic. And five minutes later, the doctor said, okay, I got everything. We're done. I was like, okay. So I went to sit up and they were like, don't sit up yet. I was like, why not? We're done. She was like, no, we have to make sure you don't overbleed. We have to make sure you don't get dizzy. So we'll tell you when to move. We'll tell you when, you know, guide you slowly. We're going to help you. And so that's what happened. They had me wait, laying down for about five minutes. Um, they helped me sit up. They helped me stand up, make sure I was steady on my feet. And um, then they took me after I got dressed um, to another waiting room. There's a third waiting room um, with reclining chairs, crackers, and ginger ale um, to make sure that my sugar didn't drop and things like that. Um, they had TVs on. And then they had me wait there for about an hour. Um, within an hour, I had to go check my pad, make sure I wasn't over bleeding. Um, I had to go in the bathroom with a nurse and be checked and um then they sent me home by four o'clock in the afternoon four four thirty around there um i just remember thinking i'm fucking starving i need to eat and we hit up arby's <laughs> that was like the most surreal day of my fucking life and then the funniest thing happened at arby's order my food sit at a booth and I find like a little card, like a business card. And all that it said was someone's always watching. And I showed it to my roommate. No, she wasn't my roommate yet. I showed it to my friend and we started laughing and we grabbed a pen. And on the back of it, I wrote like the most obvious thing that I could think of in that moment, which was like my way of like, expressing what I just been through I wrote abortions kill babies because it was actually something that I saw on a sign as I was going into the clinic so I just kind of wrote it down because this seemed to be obvious and I gave it to my roommate I was like here it's your turn and she decided that she would write something else on it and for the next like eight or nine months it went between all of my friends we would write something completely stupid and like obvious and hand the card back to each other and it went like that for about nine months. But someone's always watching. That was like like the weirdest shit I've ever seen in my life. Like it happened, like boom. <laughs> like, here you go, message. <laughs> That's like one of those memorable parts of the story, but like you keep it close to your heart because it was like, I don't know what this means. <laughs> but I like I definitely use use that card for the rest of like the rest of my time around there and that space. After, after I ate, went back to my apartment. Um, I want to say, like, I know I went to sleep. He left that same day. And um, we didn't, like, part in good terms. Um, that was, the, our story never ended there. However, that day he left uh, upset. He was very upset that the first thing I wanted to do was eat after the abortion because he couldn't, he said he couldn't eat because he felt sick to his stomach. Like it, the whole situation made him very upset. So he was very sick to his stomach. And so he got on a bus and he left. And um, my friend um, made sure I was okay. I laid down and I took a nap. When I woke up, my friends, like my two roommates and the girl that went with me um, all got, you know, like, we're like, here, we ordered uh, food, let's eat. And we had pizza and just kind of had like a very solemn evening together. <laughs> and that was, that was the entire day. It was just one extreme to the other. It was in November. Um, so it was right before Thanksgiving. And so I was coming home for Thanksgiving break my friend who went with me she actually came home with me um the coming days I was kind of numb um I wasn't feeling anything specific um I didn't regret it I was really relieved um that I was no longer pregnant 
um, I, I, all I can say about those next few weeks, even up to a month, was that I was completely numb and detached from the experience. I went home for that little break. Um, ironically enough, I saw him again briefly. Um, he gave me uh, some money for a cell phone bill um, because while I was away, he called me a lot on a cell phone that my mom let me have. And, you know, the, that was first days of cell phones, you know, it cost a hell of a lot of money to fucking make a phone call on them. So he said he would pay for that. So he gave me the money for that. Um, and some extra money that I gave to the girl that, um, that paid essentially for my abortion so that I can pay her back. Um, and then, um, it wasn't until like maybe a month or two later that I started feeling really angry and really depressed and really emotional about things. And I didn't understand where it was coming from. It honestly took me years to even understand that I was going through emotions. Not only were they um, hormonal um, imbalances, right? For you one minute you're pregnant, one minute you're not. You go through all those like like hormones trying to rebalance themselves, which cause us to feel maybe depressed, a little sad, whatever. Um, I didn't understand that. And so I just piled on top of my normal um, emotional imbalance that I had during those years of my life. So I just kind of like sat on top of it. It just kept on piling and piling until I was uncontrollable and really angry and taking it out on my body. Um, so I was, I wasn't cutting myself. However, there'd be moments where the thoughts in my mind were so heavy and so fast and uncontrollable that I would hit my head against the wall just so that I can just fucking calm the shit down. Um, drank heavily to really numb out whatever I was feeling. So there was no dealing with any kind of emotion for me for years. It was like me self-medicating, me avoiding everything until I couldn't take it no more. And I searched for help um, as far as like therapy goes and things like that. Um, never once did I acknowledge that it was because of the abortion, because I felt that I chose this. This is exactly what I wanted. So why would that affect me negatively? I didn't believe that it could affect me negatively. However, it did. And I just didn't want to admit it. And it wasn't a regret. It was more of a shame, guilt um, from the conditioning of being brought up in religion and things like that. Even though we weren't very religious, it was still an implied thing that it's wrong to do that. And so all of that shame and guilt that I was feeling, I was pushing it away because I didn't want to admit that that is exactly what I was feeling because it felt wrong to feel that. I remember that I saw him during Christmas break um, <laughs> at a diner. And it was funny because he didn't even walk into the diner. As soon as he saw me, he got back in the car and left. Like it was when I, like in, you know, in November when we saw each other that one last time, we agreed that we would never speak to each other again. And so when I was back home for Christmas break from school, I was working and um, I saw him at first, I saw him at a diner. I was with my friend and she was like, oh shit, look who's here. Who, look who just pulled up. Cause we were sitting by a window and we can see into the parking lot. And I was like, oh fuck. And he, they, him and his friends got back in the car and they took off. Um, the next time I saw him that, that same week was at my job. <laughs> I worked at a record store <laughs> and they walked in and he walked right back out. <laughs> so he was avoiding me like the plague. Um, he couldn't look at me. He couldn't see me. Um, I guess I disgusted him. So it was kind of shitty. I didn't understand it then. I understand it now. Like I understand he had his own emotions and he did what was best for him in that moment. 
However, many years later, um, I ran into him again and we actually had a conversation about it. And he apologized for his behavior. And I apologized for making him go through that without thinking about his feelings because I didn't think about his feelings at all. I thought about what I wanted. I didn't consider how it would make him feel. I didn't give him time to even have a conversation with me. I was like, it's done. I set the appointment, I'm doing it. And he wasn't considered. So I apologize for that part because I feel that it should have been a deeper conversation between the two of us. Not that it would have changed my mind, but more that we would have been more understanding of each other's feelings. And so we did have that conversation some years later. and. Um, we actually remained friends after that. He actually married one of my friends. <laughs> we, she wasn't like a best friend or anything, but like it was someone that I had been friends with for many years and I knew her and they got married. And they had children together. So um, as far as when I started seeking help, it was a long road for me to go from seeking help to being where I'm at today. So it was a very long road. First, I seeked help because I needed help with my depression. And all of that took me down a rabbit hole of going to therapy and working through my childhood trauma on a very surfacey type of level. It wasn't like a deep level of working things out. Um, I went to that therapist for about a year and um, he, he was amazing. I, I really enjoyed my time with him. However, um, I wasn't an, as honest as I could have been. I was not fully open as to everything I was feeling. It was like, and he mentioned this to me too. He said, you know, it's like I'm dancing with you trying to get an answer out of you. Like you refuse to answer these questions. You refuse to be open. And so, yeah, like it was a long road. It took me a very long time. And I essentially, what helped me get an understanding of where I can move forward and heal from it was admitting that I felt shame, admitting that I felt guilt, admitting that I didn't behave in a very um, open way, even in speaking with that boyfriend I had at that time. Like admitting that I had some wrongdoing in that part too. I played a role in how everything turned out. I, I didn't wanna admit those things within myself. And it was just me taking responsibility for my actions that essentially brought me here. Like, and like, there's like a whole nother like wave of things that happened between then and now that contributed to my actually fully healing myself with the emotions and and the damage that I did to myself right self-inflicted um abuse that I would say I am you know I did and what I mean about the self-inflicted abuse it was like that um emotional abuse I would give myself so I like negative self-talk that keeping my like being extremely hard on myself and not having any type of um, compassion and kindness anything anything of that nature for myself I I made myself like I was a horrible person not because of the abortion but more because I felt like I was worthless like I just I didn't see myself like an empowered woman who made a choice for her life I had so much, well, I'm going to say it again, but shame and guilt behind it. And it was so like, it was such a contradiction for me because I wasn't regretful of doing it. I didn't regret going through it, but I was ashamed that I did it. I don't know how can someone live through, like, it's not an easy thing for someone to carry is what, at least not for me. I didn't see how both can exist together and be okay with that. And it took a lot of time for me to like integrate within myself, like, okay, you made a choice and you are not, you don't regret your choice, but you did feel ashamed because this is how you, this was what you believed. 
you did feel guilt because this is what you believed. And so I was really hard on myself. So I, I made things harder for myself. And that's how I inflicted that emotional pain on myself. It was the shame and the guilt. And four years ago, um, I actually had a conversation with my mom about it, which I would say helped in the final, like, let go of the shame and guilt. Um, because I was, I guess, afraid of what she would think about me if she knew that I did that. Um, and so when I expressed that to her, she wasn't ashamed of me. She didn't think any less of me. All she said was she was disappointed that I didn't trust her. And, and that's the thing, right? Um, at least for me in my life, I never had like growing up and as a, like a younger adult, I didn't have a really good relationship with my mom where I felt like I can open up and talk to her. And so that played a role in me. I would have gone my entire life and never told her had I not been brought to a point of, I might as well fucking tell you this too. Because, you know, when I told her it was during the time where I was just finding out that my ex-husband was having an affair and shit was like hitting the fan in that moment. And she came home over my house to support me to just be a support for me and when he came in the door and he said hello to her like like life was just as it always has been and she just like blew up at him and he spilled like something that I had shared with him that was very personal about my sexual abuse as a child and he used it as like uh, like a dagger for her he said, "Here, if you were such a great fucking mother, like your daughter would have not gone through this." And she looked at him, and she looked at me, and she was like, "What the fuck is he talking about?" And I had to sit there and tell her about my sexual abuse from when I was a child, but she didn't know. And after I expressed that to her, I was like, "And while we're at it, I had an abortion too. Like that's another thing you don't know. After that, there's no more secrets, Ma. You know every day." <laughs> And so she was really disappointed that I didn't trust her. And she really wanted to have that type of relationship, but I don't think we knew how. And, and so these days, that's what we work on. <laughs> and so, yeah, telling her was like liberating. Like, okay, now I don't care. Like now like I can scream it from the top of the roof and now I don't feel ashamed. My mom is okay with me. She still loves me. She still sees me as me and she doesn't see me like as this horrible person. And so I think maybe four years ago was the actual beginning of the healing of my emotions, healing of my heart, coming to terms with every choice I've made in my life.